Welcome to Market Matters presented by MyX. I'm Joe Tige. With me is Brian Stutland. How is it going, Brian? Great. Happy Monday, Joe. Uh, well rested after a three day weekend and uh, ready to trade them up and get back into these markets here. Yeah. Welcome to the second quarter. The first quarter was a fantastic uh, quarter. And uh, yeah, can we continue this move? We'll, we'll wait and see. But I think uh, I think this this rally has had has gone a long ways. It seems like people are poised for either a big correction or uh, the market to continue higher. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, we have a lot on tap, Joe, right? I mean, we are seeing some big moves in a certain commodity uh, that we're going to talk about today on the show. That's going to really be actually our stock trade of the week will come uh, off of this. But take a look at this chart. This is GLD or gold, actually, I should say. Our trade is on GLD. Uh, but gold has really exploded to the upside here. We want to get into why that happens, when that happens, and we're going to talk about more with that, included on our big story of the week here, five straight months, up months for the S&P 500. So what that means for the market, what happens 12 months later after that. So stay tuned and watch those two, a trade on GLD and, and more about the S&P 500 and where that's going. Yeah, uh, can't wait to get into all that. Uh, real quickly, we'll do the preview Big story of the week is going to be the jobs report coming on Friday. That will move the market. It will move interest rate expectations. It'll move volatility. Uh, we usually think of this as like an earnings report for the economy. Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, unemployment rate, you know, we're continuing to see that uptick a little bit, Joe. Uh, what is it? Up about a half a percent now since it's lows. So what does that really mean for the market? I think, you know, the Fed is looking at that. We continue to see a little bit of a rise in unemployment rate that now gives you know, fuel to the fire for the Fed to cut rates is which they want to do, not as much as what the market expected. But this will be a big indicator this Friday. We expect volatility to sort of kind of remain skittish. People sort of using options to position themselves ahead of this jobs report. You know, for me, uh, the thing that's going to derail this market would just be a, a faltering economy uh, short of something like a big miss on the headline number. Uh, you know, uh, I think the market will be just fine with that. The inflation, the unemployment rate, excuse me, ticking up. I think the market's comfortable with that. Uh, hourly wages, it's going to be critical as to, you know, how how aggressive the Fed can be the rest of the year. Speaking of which, this is this is our forte, Brian. This is what we look at every day. Of course, uh, the VIX and volatility, um, you know, uh, we've got a big jump in volatility uh, over just the past week. Why is that normal to you? Well, yeah, I mean, when, you look at the, when you look at the VIX and volatility, you know, we had a four day only trading week, right? So we're missing a day. So what happens is option traders will decay the value of options expecting one less trading day. And so that's reflected in the VIX. Remember, the VIX the volatility index is measuring the price of the premium of S&P options. And so if they're taking premium levels down to factor in the weekend, you sort of had this dip in the VIX below well below what the futures curve is shaping out to be now we're back into a normal week we've seen the vix pop but that's kind of an artificial move like i said we actually normally this volatility report about the vix futures curve we have some sort of indication to help you out on but hey it looks pretty normalized here we're seeing the vix trade back down to where you know probably expectations for movement in the market are at and and we're really seeing a normalized futures curve out so nothing really interesting to happen i probably expect the vix to continue to tick up closer towards that front month vix future as we get or maybe the whole curve will just shift higher as we sort of get into this friday unemployment report and that's a great point the other point to to look at it this chart um is you know a month ago and two months ago um you know we were we were expecting volatility in march we didn't really get that yet these front month futures are about 50 cents higher and the market's a lot higher too so uh there's just more expectations for volatility right now uh, even though the market's higher so that's something that's something uh, interesting to watch uh we shouldn't sleep on that yeah we, i mean we talked about that when the vix broke certain levels right that that volatility would come crashing in it really hasn't it's the vix futures have remained somewhat elevated so that's still a little bit of a worry in the market and uh, another thing brian we look at Constantly, of course, we're looking at the volatility futures. We're also looking at the the underlying volatility of the S and P five hundred. Um, this is a you know one way of measuring the skew. Looking at the twenty five delta put against the twenty five delta call three months out in the S and P five hundred. Um, you know this is a, 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 a an index that tracks the VIX relatively closely. 
uh, but it gives us, uh, you know, clues. Sometimes the, the VIX is missing. Uh, you look out last October, um, you know, the market was at a relative low and people were panic buying these puts. So puts were a lot higher back in October. This actually led the market rally. This peaked before the market bottom. So this was, a, a, you know, like a leading indicator. Hey, uh, something's going on here. Uh, uh, the, somebody knows something. So I expect when the market's at a relative low, this index is going to be at a relative high. When the market's at a relative high, this index is going to be a relative low. Yeah, I think this is kind of like our, you know, normally we talk about the greed and fear index, but this will be a new little segment. This is kind of our own personal greed and fear index that we like to look at. And that's, you know, how much are people buying, buying put protection insurance on their portfolio versus wanting upside in the market with calls, right? So the lower this value is, the more people want calls to play to the upside. The higher this value difference is, the more people are worried about downside risk in the market. And typically over exuberance happens on both sides of those. So to Joe's point, these puts were very high bid in October. Then the market rallied because people were overpaying for insurance. Now, contrarily, we're seeing this flattening, people starting to bid up calls and sort of hang in there. So, uh, you know, this could be sort of a leading indicator that the market is a little bit overbought. Yeah. And one sign um, that this could be telling us is, is the FOMO, people buying calls. Yes. I don't know if there's any advisors out there watching like that has have clients calling them saying, hey, NVIDIA is up 300 percent year over year. How come my portfolio is, you know, only up 20 percent or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, people are out there buying calls, kind of chasing this rally. Uh, I think, you know, that that is kind of a sign if it is going to turn around, this is going to be where people are chasing it the most and they're going to be forced to liquidate really quickly um, if there is a turnaround. Yeah, good points, Joe. Um, all right, so let's move on to the big story here. Uh, we're talking about the I got, I got an interesting stat here, Brian, here for oh, okay. you, before okay. we get there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that the market was up in November and December, and it was up in January, and it was up in February, and the market was higher in March? Well, going back in history, uh, these are the times that that has happened, that five-month streak up each of those months and uh, the year on year returns are really staggering. Uh, you know, full, we've only had one negative performance over the 12 months, uh, full year, no negative performances, you know, an average next 12 month return um, right, right there. That's uh, 15, 17% returns median and average, uh, looking at full year returns of 20 plus percent. So uh, the numbers uh, are, are in favor, uh, sec, you know, seasonality says, uh, the bull market is on and we're going to have a fantastic year. Well, I mean, we've talked about that, that, you know, artificial intelligence, AI and that new technology, is it, you know, bubblicious or is it just getting started? And if we look at 96 or 98, we've said it's probably just getting started the party right now. And so could we get higher returns in the S&P? My expectations are, yes, I am starting to lean longer and longer. Um, obviously using protection in some of our strategies that we do for clients, um, because we, you know, just worried about, you know, basically options being cheap right now to add insurance to a portfolio kind of makes sense to do a long, short trade there to protect portfolios. But to me, you know, the upside looks like it's there for the market. Yeah. And these are five critical months of the year. I mean, every month, of course, is critical for these companies. But of course, you have, you know, the Christmas holidays in there. The start of the year is always very important. You know, the Q1 uh, earnings reports have come out. So that's just a sign. This this market is on fire month after month, uh, putting up uh, these returns. And it's also, of course, Brian, an election year. Yeah. Um, and um, man, we, we we're kind of off the charts when it comes to election years. We're having a fantastic start to the year. Uh, you know, usually election years are good. Uh, if you look at the even even better with a sitting president uh, election year, um, you can see uh, this blue area is the non COVID um, uh, election election year. So we're ahead of that pace. But uh, we're at the time of the year where we see some consolidation. We see, you know, we had a good start to the year and then uh, we consolidate uh, up until the summer where until the rally will continue. Yeah, I like how this data actually took out the COVID year as sort of an anomaly uh, on the election year. And then, you know, you look at the sitting president and what it's done. So, yeah, it makes sense. Probably we're in an area of 
consolidation. Uh, you know, I expect the earnings, you know, we're in this new quarter. We're going to get earnings reports coming out in a couple of weeks here. To, and that's been the driver. That was a driver for the market to continue to move higher in the end of January. Um, I expect earnings to be strong too, but does that mean look at, you know, look at that move that we've made so far this year. Does it continue to move higher? I don't know, but at least it supports the market. Maybe we get some back in at fourth action, you know, for the next six months as a sell in May go away comes here in the second and third quarter. Um, but then look at the back half of the year, certainly uh, an opportunity to, you know, look for getting along the market. Yeah. So anyways, let's get on to uh, our big story. You know, we talked about at the start of the year, if this rally is, is going to fizzle out, it's going to be because the economy falters. And we're going to see that in the employment data, big numbers employment wise coming later uh, on this week, of course, uh, Brian. And, you know, if you look at the big chart of unemployment, it doesn't really look like it's done much. We're right there, essentially under 4% where we were, you know, pre-COVID, obviously. Um, uh, but if you kind of zoom out or zoom in, excuse me, and just look narrowly just at the last six months, yeah, we are we are on an uptrend uh, when it comes to unemployment. Yeah, I mean, that's probably what the Fed is looking at to say, you know what, maybe we can actually cut rates. If this trend continues to move higher, we get a print of, let's say, 4%, then 4.1% or something like that. And the trend continues to be higher off those lows. The Fed is going to be more probably likely to then make those three rate cuts that they're talking about. So maybe that's what they're seeing. Anecdotally, although I don't like these like one-off situations, I was just down in Nashville and I got to tell you, the place was booming. I mean, I don't know if it was spring break or what, but it was packed everywhere. Uh, you know, from whatever kind of entertainment you wanted, there were crowds there. And so to me, it seems like the economy is still very strong, despite this uptick of unemployment reports. So I think we're going to need a couple more ticks for the Fed to really get it right and want to have to cut rates. Well, yeah, hot manufacturing numbers this morning, too, um, you know, in spite of which the market is down. The market's down. Um, that must be like an April Fool's joke or something. But uh, all is OK because the uh, semi uh the semis are up today at one percent. So uh, <laughs> so it might, it might just be a, a little little joke for the morning. Um, but, yeah, we were talking about earlier on, you know, for me, this the the, the on farms numbers are going to be critical to see. The wages, of course. Uh, and I actually think, you know, the Fed, in spite of this higher inflation, they're going to cut. Uh, they're, they're not going to wait for it to get to 2%. Of course, it is an election year. Maybe that has something to do with it. But they're going to cut. Um, they're they're going to allow inflation to run hot. That's essentially what the market was saying at the start of the year when they expected six cuts. Well, inflation's a little bit hotter than they thought it. The economy is a little bit stronger than they thought at the start of the year. We're down to three cuts. But we don't necessarily need any cuts, given how hot the economy is, given where unemployment is. Uh, but uh, what Powell actually said when he was kind of saying, you know, we're going to cut three times, was he said, we don't have the runaway inflation. We don't have higher wages leading to, uh, you know, uh, leading to work, uh, employers saying, hey, I need to raise my prices. Uh, which leads to workers having to pay higher prices, which leads them to turn around to their employers and say, hey, I need some higher wages, which becomes this cycle of the employers need to uh, raise prices again, which turns into the runaway inflation. Powell said we don't have that. So if the wage if the wage numbers stay in line, um, I think the market will be fine with that. The Fed will be on pace to cut three times this year. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be right on course uh, where we were a week ago. Yeah, I think that the word runaway is, is key here, right? Because if we get runaway wage inflation or other inflations, now the Fed will start to lose control of how they control the money supply. And there's nothing more than the Federal Reserve wanting to control the money supply globally for the rest of the world. Like a little inflation is kind of good because it allows us to sort of borrow debt. And then years down the road, that debt, we really borrowed it a lot cheaper because all those other countries that were lending to us, you know, the uh, Asia's of the world, you know, China, Japan, and others that do so, their money is worth less. So a little inflation is good. It allows us to borrow at cheaper rates. A lot of inflation is bad because then we start to lose control of that. So uh, I think Paul wanted to see an uptick inflation back a couple of years ago, and they were a little slow to move. And then boom, all of a sudden we got a huge numbers coming out in 21, end of 21 into early 22. And they had to be very aggressive so that we don't lose control of how we move the money supply and control that. Yeah, you know, it was a decade of like zero inflation. I think 
China's manufacturing had a big factor to do with that. Uh, we kind of stopped. We kind of cut China off. We uh, are not trading as much with them anymore. It looks like we're trying to move that to India. I think it'll take some time to pan out. Anyways, uh, let's bring it on to uh, the big stocks of the week and our big trade of the week. Uh, you know, Brian, since the Fed meeting, the best performing sectors are metals. And the uh, top of the top metals is uh, what we, we like to call physical Bitcoin or, uh, or gold. <laughs> Um, and look, look at this chart over the past four years here, Brian. It just had trouble uh, at 2100 breaking out. Uh, yes, definitely looks like that that classical inverse head and shoulders pattern here. Uh, and then just has this really nice breakout here. Yeah, it does from a technical basis. That range really from where it sort of hit the bottom part of the head to the breakout uh, is, you know, roughly 450 points. So typically, like when we look at price targets, that would sort of give us then the breakout 450 points higher, which maybe takes gold right to that 2500 mark. Um, you know, it seems like if we look back, uh, I think we have a chart of that, right? Looking back of what happens to gold as the Fed cuts rates. Um, Joe, if you could kind of highlight here, right? 2007, Fed starts to cut rates because of the housing market into 2008. Boom, gold takes off. Uh, you know, we saw that again, 2019 Fed holds, you know, kind of dovish, boom, gold takes off. So um, when the Fed gets into cutting mode, it's really benefited those gold bugs. Uh, you know, the Warren Buffett's of the world don't like owning gold, but there's a place for it. There's an inflation trade to it um, or reflation, I should say, almost. And when the Fed becomes very dovish, is in rate cutting mode, you know, it, it probably makes sense to hold gold in a portfolio that's what we're trying to figure out right now, how to fit that in for uh, investment advisors that we work with as we set up model portfolios for people, we're thinking about, hey, can we allocate something here to gold? Does it make sense? Does it have more upside? Yeah, I mean, these runs that it has uh, when it's just on this momentum are phenomenal. Now, there are a lot of volatility. Uh, obviously, this was uh, a lot of volatility here, but um, it does it does have a tremendous it is a tremendous momentum trade um and it's essentially a conviction trade for people who are saying we're going to see inflation uh and i'm gonna i'm gonna back it up by by getting into gold yeah uh yeah i mean so like you know obviously gold is just it's just a metal you know there's not really a whole lot of practical uses for it uh versus you know other metals but but here it is sort of a measure of of what the value of the U.S. dollar is. I know people like to say Bitcoin and certainly there's been a huge inflows into the ETFs and piling into that things out uh, put out that, hey, you should own about five percent Bitcoin in the portfolio. But I think Bitcoin has a lot more to it than just a reflation trade. It's got mining capabilities. It's got AI plays. It's got you know a whole bunch of stuff in there that would affect the price of that relative to gold is is really the reflation trade yeah bitcoin for me is just a risk on uh risk off type of a trade a uh, lot of technology type trades a uh, um, lot more volatile even though gold is very volatile but Bit bitcoin is a lot more volatile even even than gold yeah all right so i got a trade here you know, the average person probably is not going to trade gold and hold gold bars stored under their pillow in their house. But you can trade GLD. It's an ETF that tracks gold. Uh, and if you look at some of the charts on the technical basis, we talked about this range of where it's been and then the breakout. So that was about a $41 range for GLD and then broke out from there. So if you look at sort of that $200 level uh, to $190 ish. $41 back to the upside. That puts you around the 235, 240 range um, as in terms of upside technically where I think gold can make a next stop at. Now, maybe I missed some of this trade. Maybe I missed a little bit of this breakout. I'm going to use options. I'm going to use a call spread. And I'm going to look about six months out to give myself some time to work for this trade here. Um, I want to do a call spread. I want to buy a somewhat at the money call, which is in this case, the 205 call expiring in September. I'd pay about $11.50 for that. And then since I have a price target here where I think gold can get to and I'm willing to be called away, and that's sort of my level, I can lower the cost of that call I bought by selling the 235 call, the $235 call for $2.50. Net, net, that's a $9 debit. So break even is $214 uh, on the upside. So as long as GLD gets above there, all the way to 235, I get to profit. So 
Um, I'm getting about a two and a half to one payout here. I can use some leverage, right? So the other interesting thing about this, the cost of this trade is not that much. It's about 3% or so, uh, 4% of the stock value right now. Um, and th that call is already somewhat in the money. So I would actually recommend for myself, what I'm looking to do is what I want to do is I want to buy two of these call spreads for every, let's say, you know, little bit of gold that I wanted to own. And I can get a little bit of leverage, let's say, to the upside and get twice the, the bang of my buck. And then if things break down, the Fed doesn't cut rates like everybody expects, gold reverses. I would expect gold to fall tremendously, all maybe back down to the lows that we saw in that trend cha channel. So this is why a call spread protects me from only outlaying that $9 amount versus holding gold and watching it just fall out of bed. Yeah, so that uh, effectively uh, is a two to one, better than a two to one payout. Um, and yeah, so um, obviously also that $9, um, it seems expensive, but you know, just buying gold outright, we, we saw it at 160, um, you know, a year ago. So just, you know, you know, 170, just a half a year ago. So it could, it could move the other way against you and you're only risking $9, obviously. Uh, that is the other benefit. The other way, doubling it up, of course, um, uh, increasing that leverage. I think that makes a lot of sense too, because you're, you're pretty confident about the upside. Um, so you don't need to like, you know, make a home run by it going, by it going to like 300, you know, I think you can have be, uh, be a little more, um, a little more calculated, uh, having a better play by having two calls on, uh, with a targeted price here at 235. By the way, um, that call of 250 at 235 seems like a nice one to sell, um, given where the stock is right here. Yeah. And here's the other thing that we do too. I mean, we, this is a layout of an option trade, but one thing we do for investment advisors and their clients is we do structured notes. Um, and when we've done those, this would be play into sort of a growth type note where you get some sort of protection. We were just looking at that, let's say about a 10%, 15% downside protection on GLD growth note, and then get a certain participation rate to the upside um, on that. So the same level of sort of protective play would be an interesting way to do that. You could do that across multiple clients. That's that's what we've done that for. Um, so that's something that that we also will probably be looking to do for people uh, going forward here in these next uh, couple of weeks. Well, all right, Brian, that uh, is going to do it for us today. It was a fantastic show. Uh, great to be here at the start of the quarter. want to thank everybody for tuning in and following us. Remember, if you're watching uh, live, uh, send us a question. Say hi to us. <laughs> Tell us what you're trading. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, share around the world. Uh, Brian, you got anything else to say? That's it. Tune in next Monday, every 1 p.m. Eastern, just as you're finishing up lunch before you get back to work. Listen to what we have to say. We'll be quick and dirty about everything. Get you some good tips on the day. We've been pretty effective in our stock picks and our day trades. So uh, tune in next week, next Monday. We'll see you again. All opinions expressed by Tradier Hub contributors are solely the contributors' opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Tradier nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Hub contributors as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or to follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinion. The contributors' opinions are based on their own personal research, but neither Tradier nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warrants its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. Any trades or positions discussed or referred to by contributors may or may not be accurate actual live trades or positions. Such information is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Trader Inc. is the parent company of Trader Brokerage Inc. Trader Brokerage Inc. and Trader Inc. are separate entities with their own products and services. Securities products and services are offered through Trader Brokerage Inc. Trader Brokerage Inc. is an independent subsidiary of Trader Inc. All rights reserved. Member FINRA SIPC.